It's Comics Tonight with special guest Leslie Jones, Reggie Watts, Bob Saget, featuring Stand Up in the Park with your host, Candace Rosado. Hello, everyone. My name is Candace Rosado, and I am your host for this year's Comics Tonight. Woo! Yeah! I was supposed to host it last year before the pandemic and all that, um, so I've been, wa- I've been waiting a minute to do this. And uh, I don't want to make the wait sound dramatic, but my kid's applying to go here now. <laughs> yeah. uh, some background, some background on me. Uh, I'm from Southern California, which sounds really cool. But unless your two favorite things are, are cows and meth, uh, it <laughs> might, might not be your cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my mother is Mexican. My father is Puerto Rican and Italian. Uh, so for all you Boston people, no, that does not mean that I was born in a Pizza Hut Taco Bell combo. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> to mark the occasion, uh, let's take a moment to memorialize some of what made the last year so special. Uh, Emerson had a lot of policies in place to keep us safe, you know, from COVID, but uh, also from having to go to any film bro watch parties. <laughs> uh, sorry, Duncan. I, I would go watch the 21 hour director's cut of once upon a time in Hollywood again with you, but no, I just don't want to hear you comment. It's nothing, but it means like everything. <laughs> and then we had zoom classes. Yeah. <laughs> love, we love that so much. <laughs> my uh, my favorite thing personally is uh, when professors think that screen sharing is when they just hold up their phone screen to the camera and just show you that like you know like just kind of hello you know just crazy um you know it's it's like sorry teach but i can see you got nudged on scrabble you got crops dying on farmville i, I didn't know people still played that and janine you, you got a text from janine she don't she just wants to be friends but, <laughs> yeah, you should pro- you should probably take the phone down and, and address that please we don't need to see that it's it's not our business um students also came up with all sorts of new ways to skip class like putting up a picture of themselves sitting at their desk to pretend they're paying attention fun fact i actually started this before the pandemic <laughs> in person I don't, I don't know why it didn't catch on. It definitely should have. It was a great idea. But, I mean, guess that is what it is. And uh, let's give a shout-out to every professor who had to spend a semester teaching to a blank screen because nobody wanted to turn their cameras on. <laughs> Woo! <Yeah. laughs> uh, you know, trust me, Teach. I, I was listening, but also I, I was busy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Remember when Elon Musk convinced us all to just move to Mars? <laughs> I, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> well, his, uh, his Neuralink company released a video of a monkey playing Pong with just its mind. I'm going to tell you right now, it's not impressive. Because I play Pong in my mind all the time. <laughs> I, you know, remember when I said I, I was too busy to turn my Zoom camera on in class? <laughs> That's why. I was playing Pong in my, in my mind. And I get very into it. But it's tough feeling tired and groggy nowadays because, you know, you don't know if it's because you got the second dose of the vaccine or if it's because you're a pro athlete that just got knocked out by Jake Paul. (laughs) (laughs) You know, we've gone from float like a butterfly, sting like a bee to uh, it's every day, bro. (laughs) The Disney Channel flow. (laughs) I got my second dose, uh, well, my second COVID shot dose, dose of what, who knows, on uh, Cinco de Mayo, which was actually pretty nice. When they gave it to me, they asked if I wanted salt around the rim. (laughs) (laughs) I I kindly declined, but uh, I did ask for an extra lime. (laughs) And uh, finally, you know, it, it seems like each step forward comes with a challenge. You know, like we get a new president, then boom. His dog bites everyone. (laughs) Uh, Still, I thought they went a little far with the next place that they sent him. (laughs) (laughs) We've got a great show for you guys tonight. We got Leslie Jones. Yeah. We've got Reggie Watts. Yeah. 
And we've got Bob Saget. Yeah. It's a sick lineup. Where's my hair? Sick lineup. Uh, we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Does this sound like you? You try to go to bed. Can't get comfy. Roll around. Wake back up. Get a glass of water. Stare at the wall. Flip the pillow over, but you're still not comfy. So you get out of bed. Pace the halls of your home. Get a second glass of water. Not satisfied. Get a glass of milk instead. Put it in the microwave. Mmm, warm milk. Drink the milk in bed. Spill the milk. Get paper towels to clean the milk. The milk is clean, but you still can't sleep. Now you need to go to the bathroom because you drank too much liquid. <laughs> You're dumb. Now you go back to bed, but your mind is racing. Why'd you tell that woman in the grocery store you ran track in high school? You hate track. You've never liked track. But when she said you look like a fast runner, you froze and said, Yeah, you can't run away from me, but not in a creepy way or sexually or anything. I just run fast. And then when she walked away, you ran after her and said, Ha, told you. God, you're stupid. F*** this mattress, you think. I can't sleep. Get out of bed again. You could pull an all-nighter. Go outside. Climb to your roof. Scream at the stars. Why was I born? I didn't ask for this. How do the hungry, hungry hippos get nutrients from plastic balls? Is that why they're always hungry? Ah, oh, too many deep questions. Why can't I sleep like a normal person? The roof is too much. Go down to the street. F*** it. We're walking now. I should have worn shoes. It's too late now. You're half a mile down the road anyway. Oh, I wish I were a dog. Life would be so much easier. Or what about an ant? Ants don't have to worry about sleeping on an uncomfortable mattress. Do ants sleep? F*** do they? Oh, what if ants were the size of rats? That would suck. Get back home. Climb in bed finally fall asleep but wake up with a sore back sound familiar well it's time to buy a new mattress today at flips furniture when life gets bumpy your mattress shouldn't be our first guest was a tour de force on snl stole the show and coming to america too and now when you hear that beep it's the host of supermarket sweep leslie jones uh, my name is Candace. hey how you doing candace it's I'm doing great. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you for coming in today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Emerson actually has a comedy major. And uh, the reason I'm pursuing comedy is because I realized that I might as well capitalize on all the bad things that have happened in my life, you know, uh, turn, turn all the bad things into good. So um, I guess what made you turn to comedy? People in school was always telling me I was funny. My friend signed me up for the contest and just, uh, just, it was just from that time I touched the mic, I knew I was going to be a comedian. So yeah. it was just, I don't know if it was something that I turned to. It was just something that she signed me up without asking. She told me, she, <laughs> I got, you know, she, I was always going to parties and stuff and making people laugh. And I was just always that type of person. And she signed me up for this contest and then told me about it. And I was like, oh, okay, so and I did it. So, I mean, you, you've done Coming to America, which is fantastic. You did Ghostbusters. You did Saturday Night Live. You know, how did you step into these, like, legendary franchises and make them your own? Uh, hmm. That's a good question. I, I think uh, if you already know yourself, when you step into this business, it's yeah. not hard to make things your own because as, as a comedian, you have to do that. You have to make your jokes your own so people don't steal them for one um yeah. and and two you have to uh, develop what your point of view is in other words like i if i hadn't done years and years of comedy i don't know if i would have been able to step into saturday night live and be able to form my own thing like i did i think i probably would have been just like the regular you know just like a regular cast member i don't think i would have popped out if mm -hmm. i didn't know who i was before i went there you know what i'm saying yeah, absolutely. It's not an easy thing to stick to that because you have to, along the way, adjust that also. You have to adjust yeah. it to, to new stuff to be able to continue. So it, you're ever-changing. So it, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard little balance, you know? And, and I, I always tell people, I was like, it's not as easy as you think, you know? You can go one way or the other way, you, but you have to choose, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, comedy, comedy has been thought of primarily as a career that's it's, it's for white dudes. <laughs> it's just yeah. a bunch of white dudes. So how difficult was it for you just as a woman of color to break in and like make a name for yourself? Well, first of all, you have to you have to start you have to change your thinking. So that's thinking, thinking, thinking that just comedy is for just white dudes. Don't go in yeah. there with that attitude because that's yeah. not. That's not what you go in there with. You go in there with this is for everybody because it is. 
So yeah, if you already going in there with that shield of this is just for white dudes, you're gonna you you're gonna head down the trail that you don't. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, so no, when you sure. first start in comedy, you need to be just like a horse with blinders on. Yeah. You don't need to see nothing but the stage and the mic and the people and the jokes. Yeah. Everything else is bullshit. Yeah. Do you understand know what I'm saying? Because if mm-hmm. you pay attention to it, you'll get the wrong attitude. So first, comedy isn't just for white dudes. I know that what's, that might be what you see, but you put it in your mind that it's for everyone because mm-hmm. that's not what I see. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, sure. And then when you have that attitude, you go in there and you conquer whatever it is that that stereotype is. Do you get yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. just change that thinking. Change that thinking. It's not just for white dudes. You know, it's for everybody. Especially for a person like you, yeah, that got real material. So mm-hmm. get that thinking out your head first. It's, it's already <laughs> gone. You said that it's gone. I, I can't gone. even find it. Where'd it go? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You go in there. You go in there thinking that this is for me too, because yeah. it is. There's there's a group of people you perform for also. Yeah. Absolutely. So the the trick is the trick I always tell people is um, you know you know you're a comedian if. You know, you don't just make your friends laugh. You make your friends' friends laugh and you make your friends' mom's mom's laugh. Like, you know, people tell me like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm really funny. I was like, oh, okay, but probably in your living room. But can you come into a room of strangers and have them balling? And if you can, yeah. hey, that's something that you need to pay attention to. Now, mm-hmm. when people always, there's always people that are, I want to be a comedian. I want to be a comedian. And the first thing I ask them is, have you been, have you been on stage? Yeah. And it's a whole it, different ball game. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. if you want to be a comedian, I mean, like if you wanted to be a doctor, then you would check into med school. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. You start yeah. uh, physically doing, but with comedy, it's just get on the stage. If you want to be a comedian, get on stage then. Find somewhere and get up on stage. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Because I can make my grandma laugh, but that don't mean I'm going to make the neighbor laugh. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's yeah, real yeah. talk, though. But that's real yeah. talk. And everybody is funny. Everybody does have a sense of humor. But, yeah. you know, this is what makes separates the professional from, you know, the amateur. How do you think social media has created opportunities for comedy? Like you do the live tweeting and stuff like that. How do you think that's opened up more doors in comedy for everyone? Well, I tell everybody during the COVID, I was like, if you didn't get your hustle on during the COVID, yeah. then you really wasn't a hustler. Because mm-hmm. there is so many ways now, with, like you said, with social media that you can do so many things. I, I always give it up to the people who do well on Instagram and and uh, Twitter when they when like when you can see people doing sketches and stuff like that. Yeah. That's like you you can't sh- you can't shit on people who like really take the time to try to entertain people. And yeah. to me, social media has opened up a new way. Uh, instead of people having to go out and try to get up on stages or try to get into a certain thing, they can do it at their house. And have yeah. their own people and have their own audience, which, I mean, kind of, it just, I think it kind of helps the business out sometimes as far as they, as, as long as everybody stay in their lane. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> nobody does. Yeah, it's, right. You know, yeah. it's like, if you, if you, if you really good on Instagram and you went out and you try stand up, I'm not saying you yeah. can't do it. I'm just yeah. saying that make sure you can do it. You know what I'm saying? I, I always tell people not to try to do so many things, just mm-hmm. try to really be good at one, you yeah. know, and the other stuff comes, you know, the other stuff comes when, when, when you develop, when you develop this one good thing, it springs off limbs of other stuff. Like, you know, when I became a really good stand up, I, I was able to go in and do the sketch stuff and do yeah. other stuff and it opened up other doors, but you have to have a strong foundation in one thing. I yeah. think. Yeah, absolutely. And that brings that brings it back to what you said earlier. Like you have to just focus on yourself and know what you are and what you got going on and just remind yourself of that as you keep going. Cause then that exactly. can take you anywhere. It, yeah. Exactly. I always tell people that I mean you and it's something you have to learn because it's not easy yeah. in this business. I mean, you walk into the clubs and yes, that's all you see is white males, but you know, you have to realize that you're in that room too. So it's not just white males. It's yeah, you, you're in that room too, you know. Mm-hmm. So you know, start looking at that instead of looking at, you know, because all that stuff is changing. All oh, that yeah. stuff is changing. Mm-hmm. All of it is. So, you know. Yeah. 
So you're the host of Supermarket Sweep, which is one of my favorite shows. My parents <laughs> were on the show. They didn't win. Yeah, that's what they were telling me. You're the host of Supermarket Sweep, which is one of my favorite shows. My parents <laughs> were on the show. They didn't win. Yeah, that's what they were telling me. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So you're on the supermarket, on the supermarket sweep, okay? Well, you're, okay. you're shopping. You got stuff in the cart. You're like, oh, wait, I got to get this one thing. This one thing uh-huh. is that piece of advice that you would give yourself for starting out in comedy. What would that be? Ooh. Ooh. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? That's a good question, too. Uh, I, I think the advice what I would give myself is to keep going. It's, it, it's truly the only advice when you first start out is keep going. Keep yeah. going up. Keep going up. Keep going up. Keep writing. Keep going up. It's just the only... Because then when you first start, and it's very hard like to... to I always tell comics, you, when you start in comedy, you're like an infant. So your first year, you're a toddler. You're doing fart jokes. You're doing shit jokes. You're doing yeah. nasty jokes. That's because that's your your baby. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Then you you know you don't start really doing real jokes until maybe three or four years in when you maybe have written something that you can do. You know what I'm saying? So in those years, you have to continue to tell yourself, "Don't quit. <laughs> don't yeah. quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. This is hard, but keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going." I mean, that's the only thing. Um, it's literally the only like advice that you need at that time is keep yeah. going, keep writing, keep going, keep going, keep going up. Because I tell comics, I mean, you really are not going to be funny until ten years. Is yeah, I, that makes I mean, sense the day, though. Yeah, the day I got told that, I cried like a baby because I had already <laughs> been doing it like six years. I was like, "Yo, I'm funny. I know I'm funny." And yeah. and I remember talking to a veteran, and I was like, "So when do you actually like?" you know, really know. And it was like 10 years. I was like, what? No, <laughs> I just, like, no. Like, how about so, 10 hours? Like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, it's actually true, because at 10 years is when I really started doing real material about myself and yeah. separating myself from the bunch. So yeah. it's kind of true. That's awesome. Well, Leslie, I want to thank you so much for coming here today, answering some questions. Thank you thank so much you. for being here. Thank you for having me. You know, keep your head up. Keep writing. Uh, uh, Be true to yourself. When you get on stage, there is a feeling that you have. Don't harness that feeling. Give that feeling out because that's that's the feeling that's going to help you be successful. And and every true comic that's really good do have that feeling. A lot of us keep it inside because they don't know what it is. But that is a feeling that is supposed to be given out. So when you're on stage and you feel have that feel, you know, that free feeling, that's a real feeling. So go with that. Ride that way. That's where you're supposed to be at. That's where people want to see you at. This year, a few comedic arts students brought a mic, a portable speaker, and their comedy to the Boston Common. Here's Stand Up in the Park. All right. So this is, uh, this is Stand Up in the Park. That's right, yes. Stand Up in the Park was something that... Uh, a group of friends of mine and I, we, we got here and we were like, we want to do comedy so badly, uh, but all the clubs are closed right now. How can we go out and do it? Boston Commons are right here. Why not just try out material right there? So we've been doing that uh, ever since the beginning of this year. We know COVID's been bad. Um, and so uh, we're, we're, we're making some changes, you know, we're making some changes. So uh, you know how you had spring break? We're gonna give you something better. We're gonna give you some Wednesdays off. Excuse me? Wednesday? Having a Wednesday off is like having an Oreo without the cream. Uh, There's a big problem with uh, the US post office system. Um, Why is it called mail? Like, I don't know, that's really sexist. Like, why why not a female man? Like, a female woman? You see, I went to a Tony Bennett concert recently, and uh, I think I was the youngest one there by about 150 years. Yo, it is uh, it's an interesting time to be an Asian. You guys remember when Crazy Rich Asians came out with the movie? I was like, yo, we are killing it, dude. We got a fucking Oscar. And then 
And then Parasite came out. I was like, yo, we are killing it. And then another Parasite came out. We are killing it. <laughs> Sasha, why do you like look me up online? That's so weird. And I'm like, oh, why did your mom donate $2,700 to Chris Christie's presidential campaign in September of 2015? Like, <laughs> that seems like a you problem. I don't know. Everyone's lonely now, you know? It's a pandemic. It's crazy, you know? Because of the pandemic, nobody's wanted to hang out with me in like 18 years. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> Everyone's like, I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert, I'm somewhere in between. It's called being an ambivert, which basically means that I like hanging out with people and they don't like that. <laughs> Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you. As many of you know, our friend Robert Colby passed away last month. He worked at Emerson for 44 years and was a professor and chair of the Performing Arts Department. Bob was a tremendous teacher, artist, and human being. Many don't know how much support he gave comedic arts. If you were in the program, you have been shaped by Bob Colby. If you've taken improvisation or sketch with Holly Tarnauer or Aaron Schwal, you have been taught by Bob Colby. If you've taken physical comedy with Natty Justiniano, that was supported by Bob Colby. If you have been in an Emerson stage show, that was made possible by Bob Colby. Bob was an improviser at heart. Comedy was important to him. He believed that comedy was transformative and that it had the power to change minds. So let's follow Bob Colby's example and use comedy to make radical change in this world. That is how we use the full potential of comedy and that is how we honor Bob Colby's legacy. As comedy plays a powerful role in advancing social change, the Center for Comedic Arts at Emerson College created the Ready Wit Award in Comedy to honor a person who uses comedy to break new ground, drive the conversation, and challenge the status quo. In October, the first Ready Wit Award was presented to Raphael Bob Waxberg, the creator of BoJack Horseman. Let's take a look at some of the highlights from the ceremony. I love BoJack Horseman because it's showed me that you can write weird, crazy, quirky, witty comedy, and infuse it with real life stories and real problems. It takes very serious topics about mental health and mental illness, um, stuff that's usually taboo, and brings it into the mainstream by making it comedic. Straight up entertainment. It's like entertaining continuously throughout the series, as well as being really up to date on its social commentary. And it is so deserving of this award because it's hilarious, but it also really makes you think. For all these reasons, we, the Emerson student body, feel that Mr. Bob Waxberg and his series, BoJack Horseman, best represent the Readywood Award in comedy. It's courageous, thought-provoking, and encourages us to care about one another. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow, look at that. I think comedy is quieter, but more successful path towards social change has been not in the ways it's taken down the powerful, but in the gradual ways it's lifted up and legitimized the disenfranchised. I meet people all the time who tell me that my writing has made a difference in their lives, that it's given them the language to articulate feelings they always felt but never understood, the tools to communicate who they are to their friends and family, the strength to get through another day, or the courage to ask for help. It doesn't fix everything, but it has, in ways small and significant, helped individual people. And I do think that's worth something. What you're doing matters in life and in comedy. At our best, we can make comedy that seeks to understand and reveal. Thank you to the students and faculty of the Center for Comedic Arts at Emerson College for inviting me here today. Thank you for this award that I can keep in my home as a reminder of my responsibility. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to lecture all of you. I'm sure you thought my speech would be funnier, but I already have your award and I'm not giving it back. Our next guest inspired me to beatbox in my eighth grade talent show. You've seen him on The Late Late Show with James Corden and you've heard him on Comedy Bang Bang. And well, he's the reason I do stand up. Reggie Watts. Thank you so Thank much you. for doing this. I, I, 
like 10 year old me is like losing her mind right now. <laughs> like I'm so uh, excited. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, you're originally from Montana, you know, what's, uh, what's the comedy scene like there? Like, is it, is there a comedy scene? Is it <laughs> comedy scene, uh, Montana? Uh, well, uh, I mean, yeah, there's there. I mean, I guess there's a comedy scene. There was a little bit of one when I was, uh, growing up um but i wasn't i mean i i did a little bit of comedy you know in the 80s in montana but that was like you know very short lived but i know it exists so i don't really know the, the current state of it now but uh, i know it exists there's always someone trying to make someone laugh yeah absolutely absolutely so like growing up like who who inspired you the most like were they in montana or you know just someone big that inspired you or influenced you uh, no, no, it was just, uh, watching TV, you know, Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy and all the, the heyday of com of stand-up comedy was in the eighties. So, you know, everybody that got up on stage, um, that I got to see on HBO comedy specials and, you know, sitcoms and, you know, the Muppets, all that stuff like that all had everything to do with, you know, me give, wanting to try something, but I don't know. I mean, I have a feeling that even if I didn't have those things, I probably still would have figured out something. Yeah, just because yeah. I like it. Do you have a favorite Muppet? That's an important question. Oh, I know. I know. It is an important question. Um, a favorite Muppet? Mm, not really. I, I like all of them. I mean, I like Dr. Teeth. You know, he's he's a cool, good, cool dude. Um, but, uh, you know, I like all of them collectively because they're all such a gang, you know. Yeah. <laughs> such a group. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, uh, Great Falls, you know, your hometown, after doing some reading, we found that it's nearly 90% white people and like yes. 5% Native American. So did yeah. you find it like inclusive or were, you, were there times where you felt isolated in this white Montana? <laughs> yeah, white, white Montana. Um, <laughs> white. <laughs> welcome to white Montana. What are you looking for? <laughs> Caucasians galore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I, there was definitely, you know, people knew that, that I was different and, yeah. you know, at least different looking, but you know, there were, it's a, it's an air force town. So there were a lot of GIs that married, you know, abroad and, um, you know, had, there were a lot of like kids that were half, half and half, you know, um, yeah. not a ton, but you know, enough, you know, that, uh, People grew up with them, went to elementary school, and weren't really any problems. So I didn't really, I mean, there was a little bit of racism for sure, but nothing that I remembered as a traumatic experience or anything like that. Or, or you know, uh, I generally got along with everybody. Everybody got along with me, and um, we were all friends, and we'd laugh and, you know, at the same stuff and do stupid things. And it was it was pretty fine actually. I didn't and and also you can use it to your advantage too because you're easily re rememberable. Uh, yeah, <laughs> amongst all the whites. <laughs> yeah, so all the whites. Yes, uh, <laughs> white white. But the good thing is I learned how to speak fluent Caucasian, so I so I know I know the Caucasian language very it's well. Tough. It's very I know tough. The, so it's a feat. Yeah. I, I know, I know, I know, I know the tropes, you know, it's like when you're done cracking your eggs, you put them back in the cart and, you know, like all that stuff. It's like, I, I know all of that. Um, you have to save that cardboard. Like it's, it's, it's the yeah. holy grail of cardboard. Oh yeah. You, you got to, you got, you really got to, but uh, no, it was, no, it was cool. I mean, I liked it. I'm, I'm glad that I did get to grow up as a different weird person in Montana. Cause at the end of the day, Montana is a weird place. Everybody I know is yeah. a bunch of weirdos. So, yeah. uh, I mean, we, we all are technically, but, you know, but yeah, kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, um, as far as like your performing, like you've described it, you've described it as like disinformationist. Um, mm -hmm. how, for people who don't know that, how would you explain that? Well, uh, I mean, you know, disinformation, I guess in the, in its purest sense, disinformation is something obviously employed in wartime, maybe World War One, World War Two is when it was more, most, most employed, but it's probably existed, you know, all through strategized warfare and things like that conflict. But, uh, you know, it's just mixing a little bit of truth and, and fiction together. So it creates uncertainty in people um, and, uh, and doubt and all of that stuff. And that's what, you know, 
causes disunity. And for, but for me, I, I like using it in a benevolent way because it uh, it it puts people in an uncertain state, and therefore they're ready for anything. And so during a performance, if that's the state that I hope to create for people, so that we can stop guessing about what's coming next and, you know, Oh, I know that this is happening and I know this is happening. It's when you don't know what's going to happen, it it's more fun, you know, at least it's more fun for me. So, um, so that's how I would describe it, how I use it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So like going off of that, like just your improv, you know, doing the unexpected, do you, do you have an improv background or was it just something that you just naturally graduate, like gravitated towards or? Uh, I, yeah, you know, I, I, I just couldn't, re- I can't really remember things very well. So, um, yeah. uh, for, for me, it was, uh, you know, that was the best I could do is uh, to just <laughs> mess around and, you know, do things that come to my mind. And, you know, cause I was, I mean, I took can- classical piano up, up until bit, uh, up until about age 16, but around age 12, uh, 13, I became interested in writing my own music and I wasn't really learning the songs that were assigned and I would kind of change them, you know, midway through the song. I just, my attention span started getting smaller, I guess, for structured uh, memorization and stuff like that. So, yeah. So it just kind of, I just kind of naturally went there. That's awesome. So um, you also, um, you've done comedy in like virtual reality. Now, what is that like? <laughs> like, is it, are the possibilities just endless? Is it? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, no, it's not really that. It's actually, there's a lot of limitation, the limitation yeah. of how you're represented in the world, um, how you control your avatar in the world. Um, yeah. You know, obviously fidelity issues, like, is audio working correctly things things of that nature but uh when it's all running smooth um you know my smoothest experiences were definitely in alt space um and especially the early alt space gigs they were just really nice because they were you know i had a full i had a uh perception neuron uh tracking suit on so i could puppet my avatar which was really sweet and uh walk around stage and you know, have this puppeted avatar was just so cool and, and, and having an audience there and it, it was really fun. So there are a lot of limitations, but it's, you use those, I use those limitations for comedic effect just cause you know, it's just stupid, you know, to be in this yeah. world, everything looks so, so dumb and, so, and then it's so rickety and it's kind of, it's just funny. Going back into tech, you know, I, I've heard that you're really interested in it. You really enjoy it. And you've also created an app, which is, it's, oh yes so cool yeah so how do you how do you think that current day social media affects comedy content today like you know you said it's it's good to have a platform and you know to network and have a good idea but how do you think it's changing comedy yeah um well i mean it, it definitely gives more of a platform to more people that may not have had a chance necessarily not so long ago um mm-hmm. And people are figuring out ways to be humorous on these various, you know, networks. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know. At the end of the day, well, you know, there are different forms of comedy. Obviously, people can be funny on YouTube and funny on, you know, whatever video platform or, you know, put out funny videos on Instagram. So they're funny in that medium, but they wouldn't necessarily be funny, perhaps, on stage which is a totally different skill set. So, but you know, my favorite are comedians that are, they figured out how to be funny on social media and they're funny on stage and they're funny on short videos and you know, whatever. Um, So diversifying is is really great. So I don't know, it gives, it gives more options for people to explore, you know, being entertaining uh, and, and that's great. So I, so I, you know, the only change is that there's just more avenues. Yeah. And it's also a thing too, because you can, you can find out that you think something's funny that you didn't think was going to be funny if you went to go buy a ticket to go see, which I've oh, like realized. Yeah. That's absolutely. so sick. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. You get to yeah. sample. <laughs> a little, little sample of joke. Yeah. A little sample platter. Mm. <laughs> I love an hors d'oeuvre. Or d'oeuvre yeah. Or, or, or d'oeuvre. horse d'oeuvres. I love a horse d'oeuvres of jokes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It's great. <laughs> so good. I love having horse d'oeuvres with my white friends. <laughs> mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're quite appreciative. <laughs> so, um, 
like I mentioned before, like you do a lot of improv, you freestyle stuff. So I guess set the scene, pretend you run into young Reggie Watts, uh, just starting out. Would you, would you freestyle some advice? Maybe you freestyle like a sound that you'd be like, you know what, you need this. I'd just say, you know, there's nothing really I did that I would, that I would change. All my experiences uh, were really super important uh, to me being who I am now. So I wouldn't really have any other advice other than just like keep having fun and be good to people. That's so awesome. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's sick. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That's all we got for you. I want to thank you so much for coming in for the interview. Thank you yeah. so much. Hopefully we can have Wars Divorce Wars one day. That'd be sick. Of course. You, know, you never <laughs> know in this crazy, crazy, weird reality. A, a virtual one. Actually. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps. It's, it's pot. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Reggie. Yeah, my pleasure. Have fun. Yeah, thank you. And now, a call to action. When I came to Boston from California, I started looking for comedy show flyers. But the first one I found was for Cinco de Drinko. I'm sure some of you laughed at Cinco de Drinko. That's the problem. You know, I was hoping to find some open mics, but instead I found some closed-minded mics. And Sean's. And Chad's. It just sucked feeling ostracized in a city where I was trying to build my career. So to make sure I wasn't the only one who felt this way, I wanted to talk to someone who was completely different from Candace Rosado. So I talked to Nina Rodriguez. Nina is an Emerson alum who co-founded Flawed, a comedy collective for women and non-binary students in the BIPOC community. I asked her about her experience. My behavior is not such that is palatable to white folks all the time. I went into the rooms making the kinds of jokes that I would make, that I do make, and clearly I didn't gel. I'm not a white woman who loves rocks. There was just this sort of like dissonance. From there, Nina moved to the, believe it or not, friendlier New York City. And you know who else left? Tommy Rico. And he went all the way to Los Angeles. Tommy Rico is a stand-up comic who's open for the likes of George Lopez and Robert Klein. I talked to the Boston native about his start here in Boston, right down the street from Emerson. I had to make sure there were no pregnant pauses where like a racist could jump in and yell something. Like, I made sure the act was so like crisp that I rarely got heckled. But when I did, it was always ugly. But I'm sure he got some great advice from his fellow comics, right? I definitely heard the term, you need to up oh shit yeah that makes me want to stay in boston <laughs> you know after hearing that i was ready to throw bows so i figured why not talk to a white guy see what the problem is so i found rick jenkins the owner of the comedy studio in somerville well the comedy boom had sort of started bottoming out so a lot of those rooms weren't around and yeah a lot of the vibe was started by um, Irish and Italian men. Wait, does this guy in a Johnny Carson suit get it? I just find comedy interesting, whether it's diversity through orientation or race or gender. I just like different points of view. So where does a chubby Mexican girl like me go to give her point of view? Um, well, first you can find a better room by coming to mine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You go to different rooms, you network, you ask what else is around. Um, there's a whole black community of uh, yeah. urban shows in Boston that people from my side of the river don't even know about. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of different places. Um, unfortunately, yeah, it's kind of up to you to seek them out. Not the best news in the world, but he was honest. And does a lot of this sound like some straight basura? Absolutely. But there's something we can do about it. Like one... Don't be afraid to make space where there isn't any, like Nina did by starting Flawed. And I was like, does anyone want to do like a little comedy project with me? That, that's kind of how I posed it. Two, go out into the community and make yourself known. Just do it. Just find the names, find the players, email them. Three, get educated, ask questions. You have to think about whether you want to appeal to the white people in the basement in Alston or if you just want to speak your truth and hope that an audience comes to you. And number four, invest in the kind of community you want to create. 
go see these shows, support these orgs like Flawed and Amigos and even the newest one, the I Love Candace Club. Change is possible. And it's up to everyone watching this right now to make that actually happen. You know, come see us perform, laugh with us. And no, you don't have to tell us we're brave. We're aware. <laughs> Reassure the Latinx community that our voices are not only heard, but listened to. Because I'm not going to lie, right now, it's a real pinche pisa, my guy. Last month, Comics presented the 17th annual Jess Elias Clavelli Award competition. It was filled with hilarious stand-up, sketches, character pieces, and songs. Seven amazing finalists vied for $2,000 in prizes and the coveted Jess Award. And now, a glimpse of that wonderful night. Tonight, we have seven amazing finalists performing this evening. And then another thing I get too is because my name is Faith, so they'll hear that and they'll be like, oh, are your sisters hope and charity? <laughs> no. It's grace and eternity, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's no secret that us here at Chick fil A, Chick fil A, Chick fil A, we here at Chick fil A hate gay people. Wait, what? <laughs> we hate, hate, hate. We hate gay people. Oh, fuck. As a straight white man, it's important everyone can hear my story. <laughs> you don't know how hard it is to be ugly and horny. <laughs> Most people think I'm arrogant and a creep. But I do improv. And I think that makes me deep. <laughs> As a whole, the mental health of everybody in the country has suffered. Yet we all have one thing in common. We all try not to giggle at the mention of the word valedictorian. I'd like to think there's a perfect version of Earth somewhere way out there in the multiverse. An Earth where mass shootings in America don't occur back to back during a global pandemic. An Earth where I don't have OCD, or as my sex therapist calls it, obsessive compulsive dick sweater. My name is Aileen. <laughs> Some people call me Aileen. Some people call me Eileen. Some people call me Alien. <laughs> I never prep them though. Have low self esteem. <laughs> Shall we sit? I didn't fart, that was the chair. That all of my friends let me date a white rapper for months. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I'm not looking for a new fiance. I'm looking for people to hold me accountable. <laughs> a really bad year. I broke my hand this year. I got a boxer's fracture on these two knuckles, but you should see the other guy. Still adore. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching tonight. It has been such an honor to be your host. Good night, everyone. Symptom tracker broke? Clearly. Well, we have the person solution. Person? Due to recent app crashes, Emerson IT has decided to send the symptom tracker straight to your door. Hi there. Do you have a fever? No. Any chills or sweats? No. Diarrhea? No. Really? Really. The symptom checker works just like normal. Pending, pending, pending. We take your symptoms and gather the information to see if you are safe to attend class. This is kind of freaky. It's the new normal. You are cleared to go to class. Thanks. Wait, is this an invitation for your one-man Zoom prob show? Uh... Get out. Emerson IT. They're doing everything they can. You might know our next guest from his stand-up, from America's Funniest Home Videos, or from Full or Fuller House. Joining us from his own house, the legendary Bob Saget. Woo! Right. Boom. We're here. We're here. We're it's, you and, it's you and me, Candace. We're, you're in my, my virtual box, my MacBook box. We are Zooming. We are Zooming in cubes. <laughs> 
I, I feel like a cube on a daily basis. So yes, I thank you too. so much. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for asking me. I have so the role of Danny Tanner is iconic. What's that like for you? Being in family shows, I don't take lightly. And I loved and love being thought of as the dad on Full House. And, you know, if people um, look at the stand-up and go, wait a minute, he's not, but that's meant for 18 and up and after 11 at night, if you're on television, but that's not how TV works anymore. They can put anything anywhere. And, yeah. but I love that role. So you got three daughters on the show. You got three daughters in real life. You might have three daughters somewhere else. Who knows? But how do you think you stack up against Danny Tanner? The only reason I think I'm a good dad is because of how my own daughters, uh, have turned out. There are 34, 31 and 28, and they're all artists. And they're all amazing people. Is Bob Saget anything like Danny Tanner? Well, it's interesting. I have become more like uh, Danny Tanner now because of uh, the pandemic than I ever have been in my whole life. It is <laughs> it is so strange. Um, I mean, I have a dust cloth. It is microfiber. It's to clean the lens. <laughs> I clean the lens of the computer. People with <laughs> film cameras or glasses, these are non-reflective. You have to be very careful. I've become, Dan, oh, telling yeah. you, I am <laughs> meticulous like Danny Tanner. Your stand-up in the early 2000s was known for being pretty uh, not PG. <laughs> uh, what's it like now? I, I have more responsibility now than I ever had. And so I'm not the guy from 2007 HBO special that ain't right, where I was playing in front of NYU it was a different world. It was 2007. And I was just letting loose. And people went, oh, he's doing it for shock. And no, I'm not. I think it was nervousness that I would drop F-bombs. That was nervousness. That was kind of like a rim shot. But I just wanted to be funny. And my role models were Richard Pryor and, and Robin Williams and people that I looked up to that I hung out with as a beginning comic. So I was from the, 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 the goats taught me. I don't mean stars. I just mean actual animals. I lived in a petting zoo for the first four <laughs> years of my life. You know, we keep hearing so many people talk about what's changed in comedy today. So I, I going against that, what do you think has stayed the same and why? Well, I think what really makes people laugh, what's genuinely funny um, a lot of times it's self-deprecating humor. It's your safest. And my act, my act, the comedy that I did when I was 17 years old in Philadelphia was making fun of myself because I had no friends, um, had a lot of death in my family. And so my way of running from the death, you know, as I, as I was in my 20s, I'd already lost two sisters. Um, and my parents lost four kids all together. And so they go, what makes a comedian? You know, why are you so strange? You know, why is your ego so big and yet you're so insecure? I went, well, my ego is big because I'm so insecure. Um, you know, all those things where you do self-reflection and I've had a lot of therapy to figure it out. I, I think that the kind of humor that people really enjoy is stuff that doesn't do religion or politics right now. People also love you from America's Funny Home videos created by Emerson's own Finn DeBona. And, you know, how, how does it feel to be the original YouTube commenter? Like, you know, do you ever, do you ever do that now when you watch something funny? Like, Oh, let me do this voice or let me do this. Like, yeah, I don't do it as much cause I've done it so much, but years yeah. ago in my early twenties, I would be a comedian at the comedy store. I would hang out over somebody's house. We would all sit around. We would turn the sound off and we would, you know, party, I guess you would call yeah. it. And we, I would just dub the voices. Mel Blanc was Bugs Bunny, Tweety Bird, um, Tasmanian Devils, Yosemite Sam, Daffy Duck. I mean, it's unbelievable the variance that his voices took. And so I would do bad versions of him. And I would voice over the clips. They would send me the clips and I'd work on them with two writers. Um, and I would, Todd Thick and Bob Arnott, and we would sit in a room for eight years at my house or at the set of full house. And I, I would just go, Oh, oh look at me. I'm so beautiful. I, and then I do Jerry Lewis as he got hit, a hit in the crotch. So, you know, you, you started that podcast early in quarantine, you know, it's helped a lot of people out. Um, That's sweet. Has Thank it, you. Has it been as, as therapeutic for you as it's been for us? That's really kind. I actually think it's been more fulfilling for me than for anyone. The fact that people are touched and then I get positive feedback is yeah. a real blessing. And I 
deeply appreciated. The truth is, um, I, I really believe that um, we're on an upward slope. And I did the podcast to try to help people. It was called Bob Sackett's Here For You. I didn't, my name had to be in the title. But it meant that um, I was going to help him through this. I guess it's the empathy and the feeling when you're talking to people in a podcast medium that I love, 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 is it's the most like an intimate conversation with your best friend. I try to talk to those people like they're my friends because they are. They Because uh, uh, do we do, do they borrow money from me? Do I? But I don't borrow money from friends. You know, I, I try to leave that out of it unless they're really hurting. If it's my kids, you're set. But, um, but I mean, I, or if I find out you're my daughter, uh, Candace, you know, I'll send the check. I got a credit union. I could, I could give you that info if you need it. <laughs> I could all, I could get your great piece of art for one, one of my artist daughters to make, give you Perfect. tranquility just to look at it. People say laughter is the best medicine, but research has shown that money helps too. <laughs> Uh, you've raised over $50 million for scleroderma research. Tell me about your work with that. I've been on the board of directors really? for the scleroderma research foundation for a, a, a decade or more, but I started doing the benefit before my sister died from the disease scleroderma, which means hardening of the skin. Mm -hmm. And we fund major research centers and Robin Williams was the first person to ever do the benefit. And we do these benefits called cool comedy, hot cuisine. And we did the last one virtual and uh, we raised $1.1 million with awesome. many friends and, uh, uh, comedians, Ken Jeong, and of course, John Stamos and yeah. Ray Romano. And um, it was just beautiful. That's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So are you up for a little game? This game is going to be called Advice for Candace. Okay. It's, you know, Danny Tanner always has words of wisdom for his daughter, DJ, who's played by Candace Cameron Bure. And my father, James Rosato, also has a lot of words of wisdom for his daughter, me. Candice Rosado. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you a few quotes from Danny and from James and see if you can tell me if the quote is from Danny Tanner or if it's from James Rosado. My disclaimer up front is I don't remember yes. what happened two hours ago. Okay. First one. Am I the raddest, baddest dad a kid ever had? This is a tough one because that could be your father saying that. <sighs> I would say Danny Tanner said that. Bingo. That was right. Yeah, because you would not normally say stuff like that, but they wanted me to get a laugh. Yeah. Right. It's like that's in the vein of I'm a lean, clean, hugging machine. <laughs> and then we have your dad's cool. He knows what's up. That'd be your dad. It is. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And Danny have... wasn't. Danny was. Danny wouldn't have said something that confident. And we have you should take a drive through a car wash without your car. Sounds like a sitcom joke. Um, it would mean that somebody had to be dirty and it would have had to been Stamos or Dave would have been covered in something. And I probably would have said it to Dave, but I'm going to say it's your dad. That was that was Danny. Danny said it. Do you know who he said it to? That was to Kimmy. Whoa. So he was yeah. putting Kimmy down. Something you can't do today. Oh, I did do it on <laughs> Fuller House. Yeah. <laughs> if fullest house comes out, I will not be able to. Yeah. Uh, we have, um, I don't know what I'm doing, but I try my best. Oh, God, that sounds so much like me. I'm going to say I said it. Uh, Danny Tanner. That was my dad. Well, I have something in common with your dad. Yeah, lucky you. Two peas in a pod. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. I can't thank you enough. It was such an awesome time. I wish everyone success from Emerson and uh, you're the, the, you guys, Candace, you're the future. You know, honestly, you really are the shot at something wonderful and we need you. The world needs great output, whether it puts social things in people's faces, whether it tells a story, if you have a story to tell, but I wish everybody all the best and I hope to see you all out there and you'll say, you know, you gave it a Zoom and you never let Candace talk. <laughs> it's all right this is the whole point of it is to hear you talk so this that's is that's what they said i said what if i talk too much and they said no candace will be cool 
perfect. I'm trying to be cool. I'm a, <laughs> you are cool. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bob. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. I want to also thank our other amazing guests, Leslie Jones and Reggie Watts. Yeah. And uh, also, one more time for the great Bob Saget. Yeah. yeah. Thank you to everyone at Emerson. Thank you to everyone at Comex. You know, really appreciate everything and have an amazing summer. Good night, everyone. Comics Tonight is a production of Emerson College. Okay. Okay, this is done. You did good. Don't give me attitude. What are you talking about? They loved you. Every single time. Oh, I like your plan. I like your plan. They talked about you more than they talked about me. I will take you back to Lowe's right now. <laughs>